Hello, everyone, and welcome inside episode seven of That Movie is Ours Now. That's Spider-Man. That's a one-handed Morgan Freeman bobblehead. And my name is David Sugarman. That Movie is Ours Now is the podcast that's all about talking to interesting people about the different movies that have changed, affected, impacted their lives in some way, big or small. I'm really thrilled about today's guest who I discovered through the magic of TikTok. His name is Tenzin Lazarsson. Tenzin is a young guy. He's only, I think, 22 years old, and he is off to already an exciting start in his career. He has worked as a gripper, a gaffer, a key grip, a location scout on several different commercials and, and now starting to work on some feature films, uh, which is really, really exciting. I discovered him on TikTok because he came up on my For You page, and lucky for us, and and for me specifically in this case, uh, he posts a lot of behind-the-scenes content onto his page, explaining how different things in on set work, how a certain scene uh, would be lit, say, in a high school hallway, or how fire might be used safely uh, on set, how a party scene is shot, oftentimes uh, without music going at the time, which of course can be strange, and it gives you uh, a really good perspective in all these different cases of, uh, one, all the people working really, really hard, whether it be on a commercial, uh, a movie um, or uh, or a TV show, whatever it might be, behind the scenes to make even a single shot possible, and also gives you uh, a lot of respect, even more so for the actors and, and the artists on set who are sometimes acting with, you know, like I said, no music when they need to dance or no, uh, um, you know, just just nothing to interact with, and they still need to get this fantastic performance and and get across whatever the message of of the the story or the scene is in that moment. I think this conversation, if you love watching movies, is going to be a blast because on top of uh, talking about some of Tenzin's favorites, a lot of coming of age stuff, we'll talk a little bit of Coda, which is probably the last movie that really made me sob hard. Uh, we'll also talk Mean Girls, so a couple of great, uh, although different, coming of age high school uh, movies. Uh, we're all, he'll also talk a lot about different things that you can look for when you're watching movies and uh, going forward. And we, we talked about a couple different examples in those movies and a few other big ones recently, uh, including Spider-Man No Way Home, where lighting helps to tell the story. Flint, we're trying to help you! <sighs> so often, you know, watching a movie and we can appreciate, even if it's subconsciously, wow, that scene is so well lit, that costume is so great, but beyond maybe the acting performance and some of the direction, for some people, myself certainly included, you take all the other stuff that went into that shoot for granted. And it's so interesting. I definitely now have movies to go back and rewatch, and I will use the information we talked about going forward about what to look for and how lighting can uh, not just help see your actors and see the set, but also help tell a story, convey the message, or drive something extra home. And yeah, already layers to certain things that you know I thought I had nailed down so well that uh, I know I missed uh, in movies uh, in the past. And so this was an absolutely awesome conversation. As I said, Tenzin's got great taste as well with a couple of really fun um, and good coming of age films. Mean Girls, uh, smart, hilarious, uh, pretty much a classic at this point. Thank you. So you agree? Coda, I think in 20 years, will be a classic. I really did think it was it was that good. That is not a unique opinion. If you have not seen Coda, grab the tissues and give it a try. Uh, so anyway, this was an awesome conversation. I don't want to waste any more time. I want to dive right into it. This is That Movie is Ours Now, episode number seven with our guest, Tenzin Lazarsson. <laughs> Spider bed. Huh? Oh, oh. <sighs> oh, spider bed. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. 
And here he is, today's guest, Tenzin uh, Lazarson. I said that right, Lazarson? Yes, sir. Awesome, yes, Tenzin. Uh, I know you as the TikTok behind the scenes guy, but uh, thanks so much for coming on. And, and tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and, and what it is uh, you do beyond uh, just making TikToks. Because you of do, really, that, that's, the, that's the side hustle, I presume. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of TikTok brought a new light to working on set. I do lighting, so grip and electric, anything with power on a film set. That'll be that'll be me pretty much. Um, and I started recording TikToks just this past year and just doing little voiceovers and stuff. And it's been a lot of fun, honestly. I was gonna say that's how I discovered you, and and you you've blown up pretty big there. You have almost thirty thousand as I checked this morning, twenty nine point seven for the sake of uh, being precise. Yeah, we're getting close. Thirty k, here we come. First of all, can you talk about what are the types of things that that you do, the type of projects that you work on, um, and then yeah, let's let's start with that. The type of projects you work on, the type of things you do as a freelance, um, you know, a lighting guy. Yeah, for sure. So I'm based in Utah and around here, there are a lot of commercials, a lot of Hallmark movies, actually. I just got off one and I'm starting one on Monday next week. Um, and then there's a lot of indie movies as well. Utah has a lot of pretty locations. And so kind of, I've only done about five movies. I'm just starting the sixth one here on Monday. Um, but yeah, it's mostly commercials and corporate stuff. But those those shoots are fun because they're only a day or two long and you get to work with the same crew every time I get hired by the same gaffers and DPs and uh, producers and stuff. And so we all know each other pretty well by this point. And it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy it a ton. What inspired you to start uh, your TikTok channel, which is just uh, just at Tenzin Laz uh, for yes. people who want to follow you? But what what inspired you to start posting that sort of stuff? Because I think as somebody for me who loves you know media and and television and movies, uh, it's something that I I didn't even know I would be interested in, and then luckily enough it came up on yeah. the For You page and. <laughs> You know, I find myself on your page, you know, this morning getting ready just, to, you know, I was like, I got what I need, but I just want to keep seeing more about lighting and, and fire bars and, and all the different things that go on behind the scenes on a commercial or a movie set. Yeah, totally. I, I think that's kind of what inspired me the most is just educating people about film sets and about lighting, because to me, the lighting department is the most mysterious department. Um, like not much is known about it or how we light it, but it's one of the most important departments. And I think that's why I wanted to do lighting in the first place. Cause I, I was a PA for some time and just got to work with all the different departments. Um, but lighting was the one I gravitated towards the most. So I think working, I guess on set, um, I, I always wanted to educate people and help people learn more. And that's kind of where the TikTok stem from. So it's all very educational content and I try to mix some comedy in there too, but you know, for the most part, it's just educational voiceovers and stuff like that. And I, hey, I get a chuckle now and then. Don't shortchange yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, th yeah. I, I, I think it, it, it's plenty entertaining. And as far as, I mean, you're only 22 years old. You just told me before we came on, you didn't go to uh, to film school. So how mm. have you been able to find so much work and find so much uh, success? Where did your, you know, your education and knowledge of all these different behind the scenes roles come from uh, to put you in the position you are now uh, getting steady work on these sets? Yeah, I mean, I think from a young age, I wanted to work on film sets. So since high school, and I had different classes, luckily, at my school. Um, but for the most part, is learning on set. And I think just being a PA, I was able to, well, I guess before I started PAing, I reached out to different um, ad agencies in the area and stuff. And there's some popular ones. And they just kind of hired me as a PA. And through that, I was able to learn a lot. And I would always ask the gaffer or the DP or someone, you know, nicely like, hey, what is this on a, on a set, you know, and, and then little by little, I started learning more and more. And then there were lots of other YouTube channels and stuff. And so with the TikToks, I wanted to help contribute to that educational content, because there's not a lot of it out there for mm -hmm. lighting. Um, but yeah, I think learning on set was kind of the main part. Learning by doing. Charge! Ah! And for those who don't know, PA is, is production assistant. Yes, a production assistant. They are 
oftentimes regarded as like the lowest on the totem pole on a film set, but really like they're the backbone to a film mm -hmm. set, you know, it's like without good PAs, you're going to be running around looking for gear and equipment. And I, I don't know, it's, they're very helpful. So starting as a PA is a great way to start for anyone who, who wants to start working on set. With the role that you work in, you know, I work in sports broadcasting and sports production. And sometimes I have trouble when I'm watching a game um, that I have nothing to do with turning my brain off. Why did the director choose to go with that shot? You know, why is the broadcaster framing the story that way? Do you have similar issues when you're trying to watch a show or a movie in your own time? Can you sit back mm -hmm. and truly enjoy it? Or do you find yourself being like um, enamored with, you know, the way something is or just shaking your head? Why would, you know, <laughs> what have they done that on set that day? Yeah, I, I mean... So typically I have a rule for this, actually. The first time I watch a movie, I try to my, my best to ignore all the like camera moves and the lighting and everything. Um, but the second time I watch a movie, if I'm watching it again, I, I'll like that's like all I'll look at is like, wow, that's interesting. They lit it that way or they had a light here instead of here. Do not go into a crane shot right now. You kidding me? Yeah, man. I hell yeah. This movie's got an inconsistent visual language. Because it's that's like one of the best ways to learn, you know, is just to watch the source material. And but I do I do try to try my best to enjoy it from an audience's perspective without like having that uh, film set knowledge, but yeah, it definitely does affect the way you watch a movie for sure. What is one of the things Because I think watching, uh, when I watch your TikToks, there are certain things where, you know, when I'm watching, for instance, a party scene or they're in a club, uh, you know, yeah. somewhere in a movie, you assume that they're blasting music and they somehow just make the audio work. You showed that more times than not, you know, that's not the case. So what, what are like other things that, um, you know, when you got in, into the business, you realize like, oh, that's not how they do it at all. Like, you know, what are the things that, that that caught you off guard and surprised you that you've learned and now starting to share similar to that? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, like you said, party scenes are a big one. Like, it is so strange to see people dancing without music. <laughs> I thought this was a party! Let's dance! I just, like, can't help but chuckle, you know, on those days when we're on set. Um, but, like, I, I guess just like how many things you can cheat on a film set. Mm -hmm. um, I think like with punches and like fight scenes and stuff like that. And, and a lot of audiences kind of know that already, you know? So when you're watching a fight scene, you might notice that they don't actually hit anyone. Never been a fight, you? No, but that, that's a good thing. No, it is not. The most important thing on a film set is safety. Um, so, so they're doing everything they can to make sure to get it as close as possible, like the, the punch, you know, mm -hmm. without actually punching someone. But I, yeah, I think, I mean, there's a lot of little things. I'm trying to think mm -hmm. of some more examples. No, and it also just makes yeah. you, I think, um, respect what you guys and the actors are doing so much more. Cause sometimes when you see behind the scenes before the finished product, you know, everybody looks so ridiculous and, you know, cameras right up in someone's face or they're dancing without music or something needs to be added in post. So they're talking to a tennis ball and crying. I mean, everybody looks really <laughs> ridiculous, which makes you respect it that much more when it comes out, uh, when it comes out that good. I wanted to uh, bounce through to a couple of your favorites. You told me um, that you love a good coming of age story totally. and, uh, so let's start with uh, one that you gave me, won the Oscar for, I think, Best Picture uh, last year, uh, which is Coda. I mean, yeah. that's probably the last movie I watched that, I think, back in May for the first time that made me mm. sob really, really hard. Um, I yeah. get emotional, but not like <laughs> that a lot. What is it about that movie um, that connected with you and, and stood out to you just as, as a viewer before we get into the filmmaking of it that you might know a little bit about? I think as as an audience, um, that movie was just so well made, and the story was just so unique. Like I, I don't know much about you know deaf families or, or deaf people uh, really, and and like there was like an American Sign Language class in my high school, but I you know I didn't go to it or anything. Um, but I think it was just so educational and so unique, but yet it was still like true to a coming of age movie you know it's just about a girl who's trying to do her thing and go to school and i i need to rewatch it i've only watched it once but um yeah that movie really i think touched me you know, you know i i really like that one and coming of age movies are really unique i think in the sense that um 
you know, right now, they're, they're, and I'm only a few years older than you, I'm 26. So they're yeah. sort of aimed at people in their teens, maybe mid 20s. I watched Cha Cha yeah. Real Smooth uh, this year, which is one, one of my favorite movies of the year. Uh, about, I think he's 20 or he's, he's a recent college graduate. And I, I think I'm already sort of thinking, how will we watch these movies differently when we're 40, when we're 50, when we're past whatever young, angsty struggles, you know, you know uh, those people are going, th- uh, going through? Um, yeah, I mean, I, to me, it's like comfort movies. Like I, I like watching them with the sense of nostalgia, like mm-hmm. not that my high school experience was similar in any way to a lot of the coming of age movies, but it, it just makes me like more nostalgic, I guess. So I think as I grow and get into like my forties and fifties and stuff, I'll look back on those movies like, Oh yeah. You know, like I, I wish I were alive when Ferris Bueller's Day Off came out, mm-hmm. but I'm sure like our parents' generations can think the same thing. Like, oh yeah, you know, that movie was, is a classic. It's it's like my high school experience or or they can relate to it in that way. So I, I hope as I, you know, get older and start watching all those movies I grew up with, you know, I, it, I yeah, for me, it's kind of a nostalgic experience. And I think that's why I like them so much. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that Ferris Bueller because uh, the last episode I just had my girlfriend on who is from Chicago, and that's her favorite movie of nice. all time. And so, and yeah. all the and pretty much the entire John Hughes catalog, The Breakfast Club, and and other movies of that ilk. Uh, diving in deeper to Coda, I mean, obviously, even as someone who isn't in the filmmaking world, you can see they did so many unique things, especially from like a sound editing standpoint. When you watch that movie uh, again, or when you do, what are the different things you, you'll be looking for beyond, you know, just the emotion that that, that maybe we wouldn't notice from a lighting and, and effects standpoint? Yeah, so uh, you're kind of asking like about like lighting and where mm-hmm. I would, you know, what I'd notice or look out for in that movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the cin- cinematography was really special. I really like the scenes out on the boats, um, like those fishing scenes and stuff. Uh, just because I know how tough it is to film on a boat. I just did a Hallmark movie in Costa Rica in March, and we filmed a scene on a boat, you know, and it was like a Hallmark movie, you know, nothing special. It was just supposed to be simple, easy lighting. <laughs> But even that was like intense just because the boat is so small. So mm-hmm. I, I would love to take a look or watch the behind the scenes of that movie and uh, pay close attention to those scenes just because I know how hard they can be to light um, just from like a, a lighter, you know, a lighting person's perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the cinematography as a whole, I, I definitely am going to watch and study for years to come. Gonna need a bigger boat. What are the challenges or just things that you have to think about as a lighting person that most people, when they're watching a movie, like aren't thinking of? I, I watched one of your TikToks recently where you were location scouting and all the different factors that were going into it. Whereas, you know, I look at a house and I say, okay, it's 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 a house, and if it needs two rooms, yeah. then it needs two rooms. <laughs> you have a much different perspective. So, what are what are the biggest things you're looking at? or at least the fundamentals of, of lighting a scene? Um, I think the most important thing to lighting, and this is what I was taught very early on, was to motivate the light sources. So you, you walk into a room and you see what windows are there. What is the natural light already doing? Like, is there a light in the oh. ceiling here? I'm, right now I'm sitting in front of a window, so mm-hmm. I just kind of have all that ambient light coming through. Uh, but so on, on like the location scout, you mentioned, I have, I have a TikTok for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, where we went on a location scout for the movie that I started on Monday. And the first thing I would look at are all the windows, because that's what we'll be using. Mainly we will amplify those to light our scene, to make it look more natural and more realistic looking, because I think our, the way we light movies now it, it differs from like 40, 50 years ago, and, mm-hmm. and it's heading towards more a natural lighting um if that makes sense to make it look as realistic as possible um so that's kind of the one thing that i'll try and and look out for and if anyone wants to get into lighting i think just motivating the light that you already have whether it's overhead lights if you're in an office like um or windows or outside the sun you know um those are kind of the greatest light sources i think that we should use when we're lighting a scene when you're working with, uh, whether it be a cinematographer or director and the other people o- on a set, 
how do you think you use lighting or or these different stories use lighting to help tell the story? Because I think everyone knows that beyond just the actor, there is you know, there's the wardrobe and there's the effects and then mm-hmm. there's the lighting. So where do you think lighting comes in in, in trying to to tell um, a story, whether it be one of the commercials that you've done or a Hallmark movie or, you know, a, a bigger yeah. feature? Um, I, I actually have a perfect example for you, uh, for this, but pretty much like lighting to tell a story is super important and not a lot, like not a lot of people realize that, um, in this, in the movie Spider-Man No Way Home and sorry, there's spoilers coming up if anyone hasn't seen it yet, but it's been um, too, it's been too long. They just re-released it. You're safe. Yeah, I, I, I'm safe. I, I, but basically, um, the scene where Aunt May is dying, we use these things called eye lights on set a lot and that's just to give a little like i don't you can't really see right now but this window might be casting a little light in my eye you know and that makes us look more alive so during a scene you want to make sure your characters if it's a close-up that they always have an eye light and it always it just it just looks prettier you know like you think of those old scooby-doo cartoons where you can only see their eyes you know um But it was the same thing. So in that scene, she's dying and Spider-Man is holding her Mm -hmm. in his arms, you know, and on her shot, looking down at her her face, there's no eye light. And and so they're using that to subtly tell a story that she's about to die. There's no like there's no light in her eyes. And then you go back up to Spider-Man and he's got got light in his eyes, you know, so that's like such subtle things that the audience might not realize, but it, it makes a big difference. Like her eyes look empty. They look dead because she's about to die. <laughs> and, that's that that's yeah. such a killer and wow. I mean, I th- again, so watch that scene. <laughs> I yeah, now I need yeah. to and that I mean that scene hurt me for so many different reasons. Also Marissa Tomei is kind of my celebrity crush. <laughs> so for, for a lot of different reasons I was like not this at May, kill somebody else's. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> that was a sad um, scene. Yeah. Oh wow, that's 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 such uh an incredible um example i want to touch on uh, i know we're bouncing around a little bit yeah. but one of uh, your other favorite coming of age movies much different um mean girls <laughs> definitely totally. a classic in its own right and i think mean girls was really special because coming of age films have the really tough job of can we make fun or make light of some of the teen issues or angsty, you know, coming of age issues without talking down to like kids or teenagers and mean girls feels like it, it, it towed the line perfectly. Yeah, totally. I, I agree. I love the comedy in that movie is, is the best there is in my opinion. <laughs> that is so fetch. Gretchen, stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. What did mean girls do uniquely, not just from an acting and a writing perspective, but, um through lighting and filmmaking to to tell um i can't remember the main character's name but to tell Lindsay lohan's yeah. story um yeah i mean i think i i think the lighting is very motivated by the story in that movie um like the scene where the hot girl walk regina george walks in you know and it's slow-mo and it's it's beautiful lighting like every every light is just to you know accentuate like the look on her face as she's entering that room and you, and you have the fans blowing and uh you know or or when uh her her love interest enters um i can't remember his name right now aaron samuels that. yes yes aaron samuels <laughs> when, when he enters um same thing uh and i and i think a lot of the lighting is that way um but yeah it is a very like early 2000s simple kind of you know uh realistic sort of lighting um but yeah, I, I think a lot of those high school like hallway scenes can be kind of hard to light sometimes because they're, you know, super wide shots and stuff. Um, I just worked on a movie last year that we filmed in a high school and it was it was very intense. We had to swap out all the fluorescent light tubes and all, you know, uh, just to get the right color temperature and intensity of the lights. And so I, I think a lot of those things come to play in a movie like that. And it was a lot bigger budget, I'm sure Mean Girls was. Sure. But yeah. <laughs> Can you give a little bit of of perspective? Because it's always so interesting um, where, you know, we have these iconic moments in, in, in film. Like I saw something behind the scenes of Jaws the other day, the, you know, the, the big zoom in on the beach. That's yeah. only, what, five, six, seven seconds long, if that. And all of the different lighting and, and motions that went in to making that possible. I know it can de- it can depend, but how long? Let let's just use a high school hallway for instance. How long would it take a crew 
to light it, depending on on what exactly the director is looking for? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I think for us that I just worked on another indie movie. We also filmed at high schools. So I've done two in, in high schools now. And I think a lot of it is just kind of making it look natural. So whether it's mm-hmm. swapping out all those all those fluorescent tubes to a different color or uh, intensity. I, I think a little trick we do on those types of hallway scenes is the closer lights are brighter. And then as you get further away from the camera, they get dimmer and dimmer because that creates more depth and it makes the hallway look bigger and longer. Um, and, and I think to answer your question a day or two, I think, but it depends on the scale of the movie. If you're building the entire set and pre-lighting everything, it could be, we- you know, weeks or mm-hmm. a week or two. Uh, I want, I got a few rapid fires for you, but before okay. we, we get into that, I wanted to, I mean, so you're doing this, you know, you're having a lot of success at, at a really young age and doing a lot of cool, exciting things. What would be your advice to people watching who want to get, um, into the film, uh, industry, um, to some degree and, and, and like you maybe didn't have a ton of, of, uh, formal experience or training beforehand. What would you say to those people who are watching yeah, I just say the main thing is um, to try and PA, I, uh, be a production assistant like we were talking about earlier. Um, and I just found ad agencies in my local area. Um, I used to always watch the credits to movies and pick out the positions that I was interested the most in. So the lighting department, I'd find the gaffer and then I'd find him on Instagram. And then I would DM them and just ask them a quick question like, hey, how do I get into the industry and stuff? Um, but yeah, I think starting out as a production assistant is, is the best way to go. And a lot of people hate on that in the film industry, but I think you there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and watching YouTube videos and making content on your own, I think is a really important one. So whether it's a short film, a music video with your friends, you have to start somewhere um, and it takes time. So just don't sweat it. Just keep keep going after it, you know. As you say, do you have, I mean, an ultimate goal of um, obviously you want to keep working in film mm-hmm. of being a certain, uh, you know, a certain role, like the head of a certain department um, for a studio or on working on certain types of movies sometime down the road where, I mean, you're on the right path, but where would you like that path to lead? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I honestly, my end goal is just to gaff full time. And uh, right now it's very between gaffing, gripping, and then being a, an electric on film mm-hmm. sets. But I'd love to get to the point where I'm like only gaffing and I own a whole bunch of gear and I'm able to use the gear on bigger shoots and bigger shoots. Um, and U- Utah as a state is growing a lot right now in the film world. And so there's more and more projects coming out here. So I, I have, you know, there's potential for me to just stay here, but I'd love to relocate to LA or New York in the future as well. And is that the case for most states? Obviously, when people think of, of films, they normally think of Hollywood and Los Angeles. Right. And of course, a ton of stuff you know is shot or made to look like New York. Do yeah. most states? I mean, I live in North Dakota. Do most states mm-hmm. have uh, film divisions and, and departments that work to yeah. get stuff shot here or different states? I, I honestly say most states do. Whether it's corporate stuff, commercial stuff, mm-hmm. uh, feature films can vary, but. Um, yeah, I'd say there's lots of states that are growing right now. Atlanta is the, is the biggest mm-hmm. one. You know, a lot of the Disney stuff is there. Marvel, um, Albuquerque and New Mexico is super big right now as well. And then, and then obviously you have the old school ones like California and New York. Um, but I, I would say most states will have some form of a industry. I'm, I'm constantly surprised at like who I hear, like I, I meet people on set and they're like, Oh, I'm from Idaho. And, and I'm like, Oh, is there a lot of work in Idaho? And they're like, yeah, there's, you know, a fair amount. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Fair enough. A couple rapids yeah. before we let you go. Okay. When they make the Tenzin Lazarsen uh, true story, who, what actor would you cast to play you? Um, a lot of people say I look like Eddie Redmayne. I, I don't know if that's true or not. I've I could that see before. that. I mean, if you like it, I, I could see that. I, I like him. I think he's a good actor. Um, could be, could be good. Maybe. I don't know. He's older than me, so. Maybe it'll have to be some young up and coming guy who we've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll let you, you know, sort of like nerd out from a cinematography standpoint, what cinematographer uh, or, or head gaffer, if you will, you will mm-hmm. would you want working on your film who could capture your story through the essence of, of the lighting? 
Oh man, that is a great question. Um, I really like Greg Frazier's work right now. He just did the Batman and he just oh, did cool. you know Rogue One, Dune. Um, he's amazing. I don't know if that if you know my life is quite as dramatic as something like one of those movies, but could be cool. <laughs> Not yet. But there's a, ways, yeah. there, there's a ways to go. If you there was a movie ending you could change, uh, what movie would it be and what would you change it to? Mm. This Good one question. always stumps people. Yeah. I I mean the 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 final season of Game of Thrones is mm, it was yeah. was quite heartbreaking, I'd say. Well, well I, I mean, what, I guess there's a lot of things people would tweak about that last season just because it felt yeah. so rushed. Is there any one thing in particular that just as a big Thrones guy mm. drove you up a wall? Um, I, you know, it, it was bad, but it, I, I, I am easily entertained. So like I, you know, nothing <laughs> is quite as bad to me as other, other people I feel like, but um the one thing i change is give john john snow's fine like ha, like do him some more justice you know yeah. like like they kind of just send him off to the wall and i'm like well that was, that was cool i guess like i i, I think it would have been cool to see him you know spoilers uh by the way again but i know that came out three years ago i don't know i think uh, i think but, you're safe <laughs> yeah I'm, yeah uh but i i think having him on the iron throne would be great <laughs> like that i don't know maybe that's the easy option and that's why they didn't do it so well they uh they fumbled the bag a little bit but we were just talking yeah. before we came on house of the dragon i think this is mm -hmm. tonight as we record this episode four is coming out yes I, I think so and so far so good so hopefully yeah, they'll, so uh, so good. i love the the look of uh the crab crab feeder was his the name? crab feeder yeah he's just, got a just great, the look i, I kind of wish we gotten more of him but i know um, for real it was a shame. Uh, yeah, wasn't meant to be, I guess. Uh, your Desert Island film, uh, what what would it be? What would take you the longest to get sick of if you were watch, only had the one movie to bring with you? Ooh. Right now, I'm really liking Everything Everywhere All at Once. I think mm. that could be a great one. Uh, but maybe I should pick something longer. I feel like that movie wasn't like as long as you know, mm. some other movies. <laughs> I mean, hey, it's, you can put it on repeat. So that, I mean, That's true. And uh, yeah, I mean, the film, the, the the line that got me, I think that that I, I just keep going back to with that one was. Uh, oh, it brings a tear to my uh, eye. <laughs> and I think, I, I mean, that movie was so special because at least for me, and I want to hear your thoughts, you know, it was this big abstract science fiction world hopping concept that at its heart was really, really simple about like yeah. humans, you know, a family connection. Totally. That's what I loved about it the most, honestly. It's just about a mom and a daughter, you know, at the end of the day. It was great. Well, and I know I saw somewhere you posted that in a similar way. You're one of your favorites in Pixar. It's probably my favorite too is Inside Out. Yeah, kind of similar. It's a really abstract concept that what it boils down to is, is something really simple of just yeah. a girl being a little homesick and trying to figure herself out. I know that that was amazing. And they just announced the second one. So hopefully it's good. We'll see. I'm always I'm always cautiously optimistic, but I think it'll be good. I did see it was Bill Hader and somebody else, I guess, weren't uh, aren't coming back. So I'll be interested to see what new emotions yeah. they uh they add in there, but I'm, I'm also excited as heck for that. Totally. Uh, before we let you go, Tenzin, I found you uh, on TikTok. I have a blast watching your stuff. So where can people um, find your work? I also saw you have a website with some of your, um, is it your favorite you know, gear that you use on set? So, so tell people where they can find uh, your work and your content and your, um, your commercials yeah. as well. Yeah, totally. Um, Tenzin Laz is the TikTok. I know we mentioned that earlier. Um, I, I post a lot in there. Um, a lot of the movies that I've worked in fact, none of the movies I've worked on have come out yet. So uh, once those come out, I will be sure to, you know, be posting about it and stuff. But yeah, following me on Instagram is another one. Same Tenzin Laz. Um, yeah, I, I'm still hoping those movies that come out are going to be good. I'm sure they will. So. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we can't wait. Like I said, I won't, we won't get you in trouble with uh, giving away any, any, any details uh, or anything like that, but <laughs> and then keep, keep doing your thing, man. You, the, your Thank work you. Has, has been so much fun uh, to watch. I'm glad I found you and I'm glad uh, you were willing to come on today. This was, this, this was, uh, this was a blast. Yeah. It's great for me as well. Thank you so much. 
Uh, this has been episode seven of That Movie is Ours Now with Tenzin Lazarson. Tenzin, thanks so much again, and we'll see you around on TikTok. <laughs> All right, see you later. Guess I'll see you in the movies.